So I, I think we're ready to begin uh, our second afternoon session, part of our Emancipation Day commemoration. Uh, my name is David Collins. I'm the chair of the Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation, and a professor in the History Department. Uh, by way of uh, this pre-introduction, um, I will uh, introduce the saxophones who will sing for us, and following, uh, following uh, their musical introduction to this panel, uh, Chris Murphy, who uh, uh, is a grace to us all, and the Vice President for Government Relations and Community Engagement will uh, introduce the members of the panel, recipients of the John Thompson Legacy of uh, uh, Legacy, Legacy of a Dream awardees. Uh, thank you. And now to the saxophones. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, we're the Georgetown Saxophones. We're an a cappella group here on campus. Uh, what's special about the saxophones is we're a community service a cappella group, so we get involved with the D.C. community. Uh, we serve a lot of the city's nonprofits. We sing at schools and hospitals. Um, and our mission really aligns well with the Legacy of the Dream Award, um, just making sure we're is doing our best to unite the community through music. So we have three songs today for you guys. Really hope you enjoy it.
appreciate you guys so much. Uh, hope you enjoyed our performance and um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Can we give it up one more time for the, ho the saxophone? How, how perfect it is that Georgetown's only a cappella group focused on community service helps us kick off today's program. So uh, just again, thank you to them and thank you to you all for being here uh, for what I know is going to be a great conversation. Uh, my name is, again, uh, thank you, Father Collins. My name is Chris Murphy, uh, and I'm a vice president here at Georgetown. It's my privilege to run the Office of Government Relations and Community Engagement. My office is very proud to co-sponsor today's panel conversation along with the Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation and the uh, Center for Social Justice. And I want to give a particular thanks to uh, Andrea Whistler, the head of the Center for Social Justice, who is really the mastermind of today's program. So uh, big kudos to Andrea. Now, as many of you know, today's program is part of more than a week's worth of events that related to Emancipation Day happening here at Georgetown. Starting last week with historical walking tours in and around the neighborhood, including today's day-long symposium, and continuing this week with a closing important lecture from Professor Craig Wilder on Thursday. Now, nearly all of the events that are a part of this week-long week -long celebration are historic in nature, and as they should, focus on the history of slavery, America's original sin in our nation, and unfortunately, right here at Georgetown. This year's Emancipation Day carries with it a particular meaning, as this year more than ever, before the university is grappling with its own shameful connection to this awful institution. But in addition to spending time focused on confronting our past on this 154th anniversary of President Lincoln granting freedom to district slaves, we also wanted to spend some time in the, in the symposium considering the legacy of freedom today and how it plays out in the present day. For to have freedom in a legal sense does not necessarily mean every member of our community enjoys the freedom to succeed. And sadly, too many of our brothers and sisters here in Washington, D.C. are not succeeding. That is what we're hoping today's conversation or this afternoon's conversation can focus on. As, Emanci as Emancipation Day affords us the chance to celebrate the granting of freedom in the 19th century, we also need to explore the meaning of freedom in the 21st century. And we've pulled together an all-star team to help us wrestle with that issue. We could not think of four people better equipped to hear from on this topic than the most recent four winners of the John Thompson Jr. Legacy of a Dream Award. As many of you know, the Legacy of a Dream Award is given by the university to a prominent nonprofit leader here in the District of Columbia working to solve some of our community's key challenges and to advance the cause of social justice. Our moderator will have the privilege of introducing each of them to you in a moment, but trust me, we're in for a treat. And speaking of all-stars, we could also not think of a better person to moderate this important conversation than our own Kathy Kretman. <laughs> Kathy directs Georgetown Center for Public and Nonprofit Leadership, housed in our McCourt School of Public Policy. Kathy has devoted her entire career to developing leaders in the public and nonprofit sectors. Through her work, Kathy shows us that we must invest in our public service leaders of today and tomorrow if we are ever to successfully confront and address the complicated challenges we face as a society. Please join me in welping, welcoming our wonderful panel members and our terrific mod moderator, Kathy Kretman. Kathy. Hey. Anybody know where to sit? Alrighty. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I just wanted to say that it is um, to say it's an honor to be here. Um, is means a lot to me, and it's not just a platitude. I'm honored because I think the topic of today is so important, especially the idea and what we're going to talk about, freedom and social justice, or lack thereof, in our own city. 
Um, I'm also very honored because I know everyone on this panel. I admire them. They're all community leaders. They're advocates. They're activists. They're role models. They're mentors. Uh, they are our future, and uh, they're the ones, I think, uh, who can say the most, uh, people I know in the city, about what's happening here and what the potential is. They're all courageous, they speak truth to power, and they're humble, which I think is really important in leaders of today. So without much further ado, we don't have a whole lot of time, so what I would like to do is just jump in. What we're going to do is have a few remarks from each of the panelists talking about what freedom means to them, and then we're going to have the panel conversation, and then we're going to open it up to you for Q&A. Alrighty, so we're going to start with, I'm going to just go down the panel really quickly, and I know you have their bio, so I don't need to uh, read it off to you. Uh, we have here Nikisha Neal Jones, she's Executive Director of Public Allies DC. George Jones, he's the CEO of Bread for the City. Lacester Johnson, she's the CEO of Academy for Hope. And Mary Brown, she's Executive Director of DC Promise Neighborhood Initiative. So please, we're going to start with Nikisha. Thank you. Great. I'm glad that works. Uh, so, <laughs> so freedom, I think in, in the in a larger sense, it, it really does mean the ability to, to make decisions, to have what you need, to be able to provide for yourself and your family in a way that is going to meet those needs. And I think also the ability to be able to walk in, in what you feel your purpose is uh, and do that without hindrance. Uh, so I, I think I'll, I'll just stop there with a, a short answer on what freedom means. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more throughout the program. So that's an interesting question. I, uh, I was actually talking to um, my executive assistant today, and we were talking about, I'll talk more about this later, but Bread for the City has been doing a lot of work around racial equity. And it's a tough topic because everybody's got their own definition. But one of the things that we were talking about this morning as I was trying to get her to focus on her work, and she was trying to get me to, figure, to hold me accountable, uh, is we were talking about whether or not, um, you know, when it came to race and fairness and justice, the individual um, opinion, how that sort of how that mattered versus the system opinion. And one of the things that I said to her was that, you know, I believe in creating um, racially just and equitable systems, both locally and nationally. And I think that's the real challenge of the day. Uh, but I also believe that individuals, uh, whereas we all want everybody to sort of get along and to be racially um, unbiased that that's probably not realistic and individuals still get the chance to choose what they want to do even if it doesn't conform to the changes and the reforms that we have. So the freedom to me is we need to make sure that as a, as a national government, as local governments, as institutions that lead our communities, that they are equitable and just and allow for people to make free choices even if those choices will conform, don't conform to what their vision is. So um, anyway, Thanks. again, I like to talk, talk, look forward to talking more. Okay. Hi. This was a tough question. I really struggled with this panel. You know, you take it for granted, you know, the definition of freedom and what equality is, and it, there are no easy answers to this. So I really struggled with, okay, what does freedom really mean? And the only word that kept coming to mind is self-determination. And having people, helping people to see that they have the right to set their own course in life. And what are those supports that need to be in place to make that happen? Um, which gets into some of the conversations around equity. You know, and then there's a the conversation, you can't talk about equity without equality, because first equality needs to happen before you can even start to It just drove me crazy. I mean, I was really excited about it, but I think, I think at its very basic, it's about self-determination and helping individuals and, and creating the situations and the environment for people to determine their own course in life without obstacles that are set up through our systems. Um, and I'll talk more about the whole equity, equality thing. I know not much, but <laughs> hopefully this conversation will help us get more, get closer to it. Yeah, so freedom, and I had an opportunity to start sharing it with my sister Lauren here who escorted me up. Thank you, Sister Lauren. Uh, you know, uh, yes, it's definitely about equity. It's definitely about justice. It's definitely about an even playing field. But for me, freedom is when 
we can bring all of who we are, our history, our culture, the good, the bad, uh, all of who we are to a place of shared humanity and where we can get to a place where we can take away the shackles of anger, greed, ignorance, the root of, of so much, of, of so many of the social dilemmas we face today, so much behind slavery and all the atrocities you see, the root of that anger, greed, and ignorance. And when we can move from a place to release ourselves of guilt, blame, and shame, and come together and move towards a shared humanity. For me, that's, that's ultimate freedom. But the steps, we have to take the, the baby steps that we're talking about now around social justice. Thanks, Mary. I'm going to ask Lysester the first question. Uh, using social justice <laughs> and equity as a framework, to what extent should the definition of freedom change? And I know that's hard for you because you've been struggling with it. Yeah, and, I've, and, and thinking really deeply about it, I think the definition should be broadened. I think we've come, you know, so often when we think about uh, freedom and, and justice, we sort of, we couch it in this uh, uh, bucket of race. But it's a much broader uh, discussion now that includes not only race, it includes gender, it includes sexual identity, it includes all of those other big issues. Um, so I think when we start to think about freedom and, and the issues that fall under that around equality and equity, that we cannot have a limited view of uh, what that is, that it really needs to encompass um, everyone, a broader group of folks. I think we sort of push ourselves um, down a narrow path if we continue to focus on one particular issue. And I think, Mary, I really liked what you said about the whole, the, the human part of this. If we're thinking about freedom and justice from, um, the, the, from a human perspective, it is about getting out of these categories that we put people in and think about as human beings, as people who care about each other, what do we need to ensure that every person that we um, connect with or involved with have the rights and freedoms that they need. And it's beyond race. It's, it's a much broader discussion than race. Does anyone want to chime in here? Follow up with what Lissester said? Well, I do have to confess that I think in our world, we have been fairly narrow in our conversation about justice. Um, and it has centered around race. But there is a caveat to that that sort of maybe comports a little bit what Lissester is talking about, which is that uh, it is a complicated conversation to talk about all the isms in one conversation. It's complicated to talk about one of them in one conversation. And so we certainly, ha at, at Bread and in the, some of the circles where we've been talking racial equity in the city and there's a real conversation that's going on, we have sort of from simplicity's sake sort of picked what we think is the biggest rock to move up the hill, which is race in that conversation. And not only is it the biggest one, to be honest with you, it's the least comfortable one. It's even, uh, people are less comfortable talking about race than sexual orientation or some of the other isms that are tough to talk about too. Uh, and, um, and so we think that, I believe that um, two things. One, talking about race is a tough conversation and it's complicated enough and, and impactful enough. The issue of race has been so impactful in justice that talking about that in a narrow way can be very functional and sort of um, helpful to help sort of frame a conversation and to keep it focused. Um, and the other piece is, and this is maybe more controversial, which is I believe that if we solve and address racism, if we can figure that out in a way that sort of um, creates more justice around that, that so many other, this almost sounds like trickle down, but so many other isms actually are embodied in that. And so issues like uh, equal pay for women, for instance, probably gets improved if equal pay for people of color it's improved because predominantly uh, the, the, um, the, the wages for women and people of color are drugged down by what, peop what, what, what uh, black Americans experience. Like if you, you know, oftentimes those numbers are an average. And that average is pulled down because the people at the bottom tend to be blacks who are dragging that number down even further and black women in particular. So again, it, the, the focus on race is partly from my perspective, it's partly on you need a narrow conversation because it gets really complicated and, and amorphous when you try to have all the isms in the room at the same time. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if you, if you can really tackle that from a sort of systemic and 
public policy perspective. And I think we've seen that, that so often it does lift a lot of the other boats that are sort of oppressed in, in our uh, systems. So, Mary, I'm going to um, ask you this question because I think it gets at some of this as well. Uh, what are some ways your work addresses the wounds left behind by America's deep history with slavery? And how do you incorporate social justice uh, in your work every day? Yeah, well, so, yeah, that's a good, so at, at, at uh, DC Promise neighborhood, where we're located, literally, our, our footprint uh, of about uh, uh, 6,000 residents is in a very isolated, almost um, enslaved place where there's, it's a food desert, and we struggle with education, and we struggle with this whole idea of family, where families have been dismantled and broken. So, you know, the, the vibrations of slavery ring is very deep. Anger, greed, and ignorance really pushes very deeply into community. And so when we see um, fragmented families, there is a way to trace that back to what so many African Americans had experienced via slavery, with families being torn and broken. And, and then the, 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 the denial of quality education. And so one of the, some, many of the things that we do, well, well, at Promise, our entire focus is to end intergenerational poverty. That's mm -hmm. our focus. And we believe that we can do that by, one, providing mothers that are about to have children with an opportunity to learn how to care for themselves, care for their bodies, understand who they are and why they are, and then how to be good parents. And then we work along with the schools so that when they're receiving these children, they can have equitable education. And then we're connecting with the fathers and the men in the community who are so important, and the elders. And so the work that we do is very deep and it's very comprehensive, all for, all for helping children succeed, parents succeed, healthy and safe places to exist, and for our communities to thrive. And it's a big lift. What, we, what started off as just an initiative is really a social justice movement to end intergenerational poverty and to pull partners together along a same metric system so that we could actually see where we're going in terms of data and evaluation. So it's quite exciting. but. I think the greatest thing that we're doing is that we're listening. We're listening to the community. We're not coming in with our own narrative. We are, we are listening to the narrative of the community. We are working side by side with them as partners. We're not coming in there to save lives. We're coming in as diamond hunters, knowing that there's beauty in our community and that there's strength in the community in the midst of um, the isolation and in the midst of a lot of the devastation. And so that is what gives us hope. And I think that that is one major step that we're doing uh, differently at Promise, where we're not coming in as the saviors. We're coming in as the partners, seeking out the highest good so that we can work with our families to get to a place of equity, to have jobs, have housing, quality education, so that one generation will be able to leave, to, to leave knowledge, wealth, history and culture to the next generation, thereby making a dent in, 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 uh, in uh, generational poverty. Right. Nikisha, you're working with young people a lot and building their leadership. Uh, what, what are you doing? How are you incorporating uh, the value and culture of social justice in your work and in the lives of the young people? So first, we actually look for young people that have an interest <laughs> in improving communities in some way. They see themselves as, as a part of a community or they want to be a part of a community that they would like to build. Uh, it was interesting listening to what George had to say. It reminded me of an essay that I read when I was an ally um, called There Is No Hierarchy of Oppression by Audre Lorde. And I do, and, and even through our work at Public Allies, we get that people are very committed and passionate about um, their causes, and when, but when they connect 
And when they meet each other, and, and that word allies, when they really understand where someone is coming from because of their experience, we see magic happen. It doesn't mean that everybody's gonna pick up the race flag or everybody's gonna pick up the gender flag, but it does mean that they have more of an understanding of what's happening and more of an understanding of, of other issues. So at the very least, that as we're addressing the issues and as we're building new institutions and new ways of operating, we'll be aware of some of the some of the hindrances and barriers that other groups have experienced. And I think that that's really important. Um, I don't know that we've, if we look at particularly like racial justice and, and African American justice and organizations um, that are headed by African Americans, uh, I don't know that we've, we've gotten that and how we built institutions so that they also aren't oppressive to other people. But I do see it. I see it happen with the allies on, on a daily basis when they engage and get to know one another more and get to know their experiences more, that it makes a difference. Well, Sister George, do you want to comment on how you're incorporating social justice philosophy in, in your work? Sure, yes. Um, at Academy of Hope, I mean, the very nature of our work is a social justice agenda. We're dealing with individuals who are, and it, as with everyone on this stage, um, individuals who, have, who walk through our doors are living in many significant poverty. Uh, they've not been able to complete their education because of poverty. Um, and so because they lack an education, it's hard to break that cycle of poverty. So the, the whole conversation um, for me around freedom and particularly in adult education is a social justice agenda. That it's been cycles and um, generations of individuals who've experienced significant poverty, uh, discrimination, you know, either because they're not uh, U.S. born citizens. We have a fair number of uh, folks who are coming in as new citizens, um, but they tend to stay in the cycle. And so part of our work is really helping individuals to become empowered citizens through education. We're not walking, you know, what we see often in our classrooms when students start to learn about just how city government operates, they immediately start to get become more active. When they learn about not just a presidential election, but how bills become a law, some, at some point they see that I can actually have um, a role in this. So we become fa facilitators of a social justice agenda uh, in the work that we're doing. Right. George? Well, I, I was thinking about this idea uh, uh, about this idea that organizations have a responsibility around equity and justice. And I think that's a really important place to start. And I think in the nonprofit sector in particular, we have a, a special, I think, duty to make sure that our organizations are, are, are not oppressive or anti-racist. And that's not as easy as it, is, as it sounds because um, just because people of color may be leading those organizations, a lot of times sort of rooted in the DNA of institutions is a kind of uh, mainstream bias that plays itself out. And if you're not intentional about having your institutions be uh, equitable and, and, and sort of generating equality ultimately, you can find yourself creating uh, systems that perpetuate a lot of the same issues that mm -hmm. uh, the community members experience, people of color experience, that sort of oppressive. Uh, I, I was at a, I always tell this story, but I, I was at a racial equity training where I had staff there and, and uh, I'm sitting there thinking I'm all proud about how I've got 40 of my staff in there and we paid the money for the training. And the trainer says, well, don't think because you got a black CEO that your organization is not a racist organization. <laughs> yeah. And he goes on to, of course, I'm thinking, okay, I paid $20,000 <laughs> to, to get that kind of testimony. Uh, but uh -huh. actually, what, what, but he went on to say that uh, you got to understand that in, in, at Bread for the City, George is probably the highest paid employee, and I am, and by quite a bit, in fact. And, and he got there by having the system work exactly the way it works now. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's his incentive mm -hmm. for changing anything about the way, way Bradford said he's already, already in the catbird seat, so to speak? Mm -hmm. And that's really true, and I think the moral of that story, the thing that it really sort of made me realize is that you have to be willing to put some of your privilege, which is what I have by being the highest paid employee and the person with probably the most power in the organization, I have to be willing to put some of that privilege, both my salary and my power, at risk if I'm going to change the institutions 
that and the policies that govern breadth of the city. So for instance, if I'm going to have a board that's more diverse and more reflective of, and I, I've gone through this over the last few years, it's more reflective of the communities we serve, I've got to be willing to push a board that is, that historically had been predominantly white and that so the thought the world of me and gave me this high salary and all that stuff that, that put me in this position. Now I've got to go to them and say, oh, we want to sort of change this board so that it's a much more um, inclusive board. And, um, and I've got to sort of be willing to say things like, I'm going to make sure that we adjust our, our pay scale from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. with, because not surprisingly, just like many institutions, the people who are the lowest paid at Bradford City are people of color like our receptionists and the maintenance people and all those people. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that they're predominantly people of color and the people who were serving as lawyers and doctors and, and Indian chiefs at my organization, me. Uh, uh, but mostly, uh, we're not. And, there was, and, and the last thing to say about that is, and that, for most of our uh, vantage point, was not intentional. And so the moral of that story is it's not, a, it's not enough to, to, for it to not be uh, unintentional or for it to be unintentional. It's important for it to be intentional mm -hmm. to sort of change those things. You have to be willing to talk explicitly about race and how it's playing itself out uh, in, with the policies you have. So I think that's just when, this idea of looking at institutions and having institutions hold themselves accountable to not perpetuating uh, racism is really important. I'm going to come back. Oh, no, oh, sister, I, I just want to say thank you to George for saying that, because I, you and I were in the, at the social justice conference maybe two years ago in 2014. And when you talked about your willingness to sort of really put yourself out there in looking at your own organization, which has really sparked me, because I hadn't really been very, I hadn't been fully conscious of, you know, the fact that, you know what, yes, there is a problem. When I started to look at my organization, when we pull the numbers and look at, we, we are racially diverse, ethnically, you know, all of that. But when I start to look at the higher paid positions, we are not. And, you know, just because I'm an African-American woman running a nonprofit that's serving primarily 98% of the individuals that we serve are individuals um, who are African-American, why is it that my board and the folks who are in those leadership positions don't reflect that. And it was a hard pill to swallow, but it was, you know, sitting and hearing you say that, that I have really started to think long and hard, not long and hard, not just think, trying to move to action is one thing to think about this, but it's, it's about doing something about it and what are we doing around the policies that we've created and, and the board that we have uh, and being very intentional about even what are, what are some of the unconscious biases that I have that prevent this from happening at all levels and doing something very intentional about changing that. And, and I do want to stick with the time, but what's so interesting is that I had the great fortune of, 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 of being a part of starting an organization from the ground up, life pieces to masterpieces for these beautiful black boys and young men growing up in Ward 7. And so what was so interesting there is that we actually were going out looking for African-American males. We were looking for mentors to come, but who was coming? You know, uh, you know, Debbie from Nebraska and John from Wyoming. And so I had a different situation going on where, in the, in, where, where the community was saying, well, you're supposed to be about black boys and young men. Well, why are your mentors women and men that don't look like our community? So it's interesting, this human dynamic. And, 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 and had it not been for some of the volunteers that we had. Had it not been for a lot of that earlier help, you know, Life Pieces to Masterpieces may not be celebrating its 20th year today. But interestingly enough, when it had gotten positioned as, oh, this is a program for black men and boys, then we had a black president, and then we're talking about my brother's keeper, then, you know, ev everybody's lining up, well, no, you know, I think I'm ready to, so it's interesting, the human dynamic. You know, um, and it's not easy to do, I yeah, think yeah. is more to your point. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, no. it's one thing to try to have a more inclusive environment, but it isn't just... It isn't, because you get pulled. You get pulled, yeah. And I'm going to get back to this, but Nikisha, I had a question for you. Uh, so what are some of the unintended consequences? There has been some racial progress, you all mm -hmm. um, seem to say. So what are the unintended consequences of racial progress? and what needs to happen differently to minimize those unintended consequences. So 
probably a, at least a generation or a couple before mine, um, I, I heard these great stories about how in, in some black communities where there were people that lived together who were of all walks of life. Uh, and so there were networks there in that community and those networks were there and they were working around jobs, around education, around value, because there really weren't other places for people to go. Uh, and at the end of that, you know, when we had more choices or were able to get educated at different places, um, and I have seen this happen too, I think it's a struggle too with people who are even first generation college graduates because, you know, you want your, your children to have a life that's better than yours and not to have to struggle through what you did, yet at the same time, how do you stay connected to that place that did raise you and that you do come from uh, mm -hmm. and that has other people who are still struggling. And so I, I think that probably some of the unintended consequences are that we, we don't have a lot of communities like that where that kind of networking is happening. And, and because of the impact of the institutional racism that, that's still around, a lot of people don't feel valued. And, and my heart is really heavy today. Uh, I live in Ward 7, and so you all may have heard that there were a couple of killings of young people at the Deanwood Metro. And, you know, I, I live one stop away and near Minnesota Avenue, and so it really does. Like, I, I used to struggle with that. You know, I, I struggle with, you know, there's trash on the streets or, you know, there's, there are gunshots, and why do people do this? And, 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 I, and I really... I get that. Uh, it's because they don't feel valued by a larger society. And so in a lot of ways, they're not valuing themselves. And so I think that's where the minimization comes in. It's, it's really about relationships and value and every chance we get to encourage people and let them know that they do have value, even though they are struggling. Um, that even when we talk about communities that are struggling in some ways to highlight those things that are working very well. Um, and it's interesting because I, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to work in Berry Farm. And, you know, people would say that that community's broken in a lot of ways. Um, but I was working with a group that was doing some surveys. And uh, that was one of the ways that the community showed that it was very intact. Uh, our survey people went out and they got nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they went out for about a week, kept knocking on doors, and no one would complete a survey, no one would answer the door. Uh, and so uh, about a week later, we had a community meeting and some people came to the meeting and said yes I, I know they've been out yes I know no one's talking to them and this is what you need to do to come to our community first you need to let us know when it's happening mm -hmm. then you need to identify yourselves then you need to have some community ambassadors that are out there to make introductions and to help support your work here and after we did those things we got a ton of responses. Um, I don't know if you know, in survey land, I think, you know, 20% is a really magic number. I think we ended up getting close to 50% of the community surveyed and things like pizza at basketball games as people were completing the surveys. But it just showed that even in a community that I think may appear broken or gets talked about as being broken or is really broken in, in some ways, um, that there really are some things that work and how do we highlight those? And let that be a lesson to everyone who's doing yeah. surveys <laughs> and the faculty that are supervising them. Thanks. Anybody else want to say anything about what you see as unintended uh, consequences of, of progress? I, oh, you're about to say something. Oh, oh I thought uh, you were about to. Uh -huh. Yeah, one, I think I, I would agree with Nikesha um, that, you know, I, my parents, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Both my parents were, um, you know, grew up in the Jim Crow era, so they had a very, um, you know, first-hand experience about what it means to be in a tight-knit community when you couldn't access the, the broader community. And um, they, it was a farm community, too, so it's a, just a very different dynamic, and they moved to the big city of Birmingham. Um, but I do recall my father saying at one point, you know, this, this whole thing about integration is good, but now all of our doctors are gone. I've got to travel across, you know, the city to get to a doctor or, you know, the, the teachers don't live in the neighborhood again, and they saw firsthand what happened, 
you know, uh, with, with integration and when people were able to move out of those, those segregated neighborhoods or from across the tracks, you know. Um, so, I, yes, there was, I think there's that unintended con uh, consequence. I grew up, I remember my mom being completely frustrated because of busing. So I grew up in a school, uh, the high school that I went to was probably one of the number one dropout factories in, you know, in the community that I grew up in. But what was happen happening at that time in the 70s, my mom was really angry because she felt they were cherry picking all of the smart kids and moving them over to the white high schools and putting them on the bus. So when I got my letter, uh, my mom absolutely said, no, I'm not going to let you go there. But she also struggled with you know, am I doing a disservice to my child by not allowing her to go to a school which has more resources? And, and it was very real for me. Um, busing was just, I, my mom, I just remember her just sort of constantly pacing and really trying to figure out what's the best option for her children. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there was. That my mom, and, and just from their experience, that the neighborhoods, uh, I grew up in a blue collar community, still factory, union workers, that got sucked dry. And when I go home now, it looks like a war zone. I mean, it's just, you know, of course the steel mills dried up, but um, I think my parents were onto something when the neighborhood really started to become very different. You didn't have the diversity in terms of income and education in those neighborhoods. The, the one thing I wanted to mention, in addition, that I think is an unintended consequence, is, you know, part of the, um, the strategy uh, from the civil rights movement sort of a macro strategy. It wasn't necessarily, I think, the strategy of the, the leaders of the civil rights movement, but it was to sort of try to create a kind of uh, colorblind society. Mm -hmm. And so it has become and it became uh, really taboo to talk about race in explicit terms. Like somehow that was a part of the, the agreement, is that we will try to move some of these progressive policies uh, forward. But, but meanwhile, we have to stop talking race and we can't, we can't name race. And, concepts like the race car get pulled. And I think it ended up um, having everybody sort of grow enamored with this idea of, and pe people tell, say this all the time, is, oh, I don't see race. And, uh, and my, the truth of the matter is, I don't think that's even possible. I think that's not true. And it's a kind of um, deal we've made with the, the system, if you will, that we won't talk about that. Uh, and, and to some degree, there was, I, I, there was some merit to it. There probably was, you know, this, the, I think the, um, the positive or the sort of uh, um, thing that was, was virtuous about that idea was this notion that uh, stereotypes might not be perpetuated. And so, I mean, think about, I, I'll tell the story, one story. So in this training that you go through, um, the uh, racial equity trainers will say to folks, um, you, they, they paint this narrative where you've got a, a woman with a child going through a grocery line and she's got uh, food stamps and she's going through the line. And they ask the group of folks that were being trained, there's about 40 people or so, to, to <coughs> name what you think everybody else is thinking because she's at the line and sort of futzing with the food stamps. And what do you think everybody else in the line is thinking about her? And they start saying, oh, welfare queen, lazy, living off the system, why don't they get a job? Um, so sort of, and then number so and they come up with a laundry list of stereotypes, and the people taking doing this sort of exercise think that they are, uh, you know, they're literally sort of that's the task. But the actual exercise is to see do those stereotypes exist in your own head. That the truth of the matter is you wouldn't be able to say those if you didn't have them. <coughs> and as soon as the trainers say that, the people say, oh, that wasn't what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but well, who was doing that thinking? You're the one who said them, right? And so. These were, and these were a room of good liberal people, mm -hmm. but they had those same stereotypes in their mind. So the truth of the matter is they, are able, they probably would never say them out loud again because that's the deal you make. But the truth of the matter is you do need to grapple with your own biases. Mm -hmm. And if we, sort of, if, we, if we hold too much to that deal that we won't talk race, we won't admit that, yeah, those stereotypes, and they exist, by the way. This was a room of a diverse group of people. It wasn't just white people who had those stereotypes. There were probably more blacks who were saying those same stereotypes. So this, it's really important to be willing to talk about and think about that. So I think it was unintended consequences that we sort of made it taboo to do that. Okay, this is great, because this is going to get into something. I know George has thought about this, but I hope all of you will uh, kick in here. And that is, in a city like D.C., 
which is historically the elected officials have been people of color. How is it the racial inequity is, is as serious an issue as it is today? So George, first you and then think well, about this, you all. I think it deals with, I think you have to deal with the privilege that goes with running those positions that city council members and the mayors have all had a number of things at stake with the public policies. They, they had their own seats. You know, they wanted, oftentimes wanted to get reelected. Uh, they had their jobs, the actual money they make. Uh, and they had, and one of the real ch challenging ones is they had their own narrative in their head. There's this narrative that says, uh, particularly for oftentimes for people of color who've been successful, that I did this on my own. Mm -hmm. That it was my, through my sheer determination and effort and hard work. That's how I got there and everybody else should do that. And this, you know, and I have, I, I just like to think of myself in those ways too. You know, everybody likes to see themselves as the hero in their own personal story, right? Mm -hmm. But if you let go of that narrative or, to, or the idea of saying that maybe that's not all at force and not all at work for people who are, are not succeeding, people of color, I have to be willing to let go of the <coughs> fact that maybe that's not, all, that's not exactly how I got to where I, I got. That maybe it was even at the expense of people who look like me, or certainly maybe it was because of privileges that I have that, that a lot of people, and you're talking about the neighborhoods that some people come from. And it's not that people don't come from tough neighborhoods. I actually was born in the projects and they come from tough neighbors, but I've got three, four kids, three who have already finished college, mm -hmm. and they all were privileged kids. And to be honest with you, that's the better formula for success, mm -hmm. is to have, have that kind of privilege and, and not to have, so I didn't want the, them to sort of take this idea that, oh, I've got to pull myself up by my bootstrap and that's how I'm going <clears> to <throat> be successful. No, we're going to make sure that you don't have to worry about where your food's coming from, that you're, that you don't worry about be, getting evicted that you're not in a place where crime is a real serious issue, that you're going to schools that are really good. That's the formula for success. So when, you, when you're in these roles of privilege, like many of the folks, and I hear city council members all the time, asking residents, how come you don't have a husband? You know, why, are you, why aren't you working? They're coming from the neighborhoods like the ones that Akisha described, or the ones that Mary was talking about, or the ones at Bradford City. And it's because those are not neighborhoods that are formulas for success. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that people won't, yeah. won't work their way out of that, but that's a real problem. And if you're uh, um, a policymaker who is trying to use that sort of bootstrap, you know, pick yourself up kind of mentality and not acknowledge that that's probably an oversimplification, if not fully untrue, about how they got to where they are themselves. So I think it's this privileged narrative that we need to really, that comes into play. And, yeah. if, and, if, and if I may add, you know, with what color, I mean, what, what, what color is anger? What color is greed? What color is, you know, is ignorance or, or uh, guilt, blame, and shame? So it all goes back to the human condition, regardless of the color. And so when we, when, when, when we, um, I mean, so many factors that, that, that you brought up here, but, but when, when people understand that their true power rests, in their own thoughts, their own words, and their actions, when as human beings, we realize that we see through a lens of what we've been taught, what we've experienced, what we've been exposed to. That's the lens that, through which we see everything. You know, that, that's, th those are some of the, the drivers. So it doesn't surprise me that when a human being who gets in a state of power and who uh, feel, and, 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 and who's, you know, because I think it's great to get all the degrees. I think it's great to have higher education. But if you are not a good human being, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. What's the point of it all? How are you using your education? How are you using you know, your, your, your privilege? I've had you know, young, young people volunteer with us and what have you. And so much, when I, get, when I start talking to them, they start getting heavy into the whole guilt thing and the depression thing. And I'm thinking, no, baby. Thank your mama for that education. Thank your daddy for putting the roof over your head. And come whole to this conversation of social justice. I think a big part of our challenge is that when people say that they're coming to serve, that oftentimes it's I'm coming to control. I'm coming to have a sense of power. Not understanding, they don't, they don't understand what their power is. And so they have what I call violent behavior. And that is, that is when you... That, which is a vict which is a symptom of the weak. It, it's, it's seeking to find its strength and its power through the subjugation of others. And that's where, when you talk about slavery, that's slavery. 
And that's vibrations of slavery, even when we talk about some of the pieces in D.C., even though the face is black. You know, because it's the mind, it's the heart. And so it doesn't surprise me, but I think it is important for us, for, for, for us to come together and for us to raise the conversation to our folks that are in power and for us to use whatever tools that we can get for the highest good of the work that we're doing. But at the end of the day, all of the pieces that we've been talking about here goes back to those basic human principles. And if that could be the bell of freedom, if the bell of freedom could be shared humanity where every person is carrying who they are to this, to the, to this conversation of dealing with some of those factors I've just shared, I think, yeah, I think that's where we would find it. But yeah, it doesn't surprise me in D.C., though. Or anywhere else. Sister and Keisha, you both look like you have something to yeah, say. I, I will. I mean, I, and, and, you know, George, you used all of the words. I was actually making a note about the bootstrap mentality that, you know, usually when I share my experience, which, um, you know, I, I didn't, my parents were together. There were eight kids. My dad w worked. My mom was a domestic worker. Neither of them had the opportunity to get a high school credential or to finish their education. I am the exception, not the rule. And so when people say, you did it, you did it, I am the exception. I can tell you countless people who are in my community who didn't do that. And so sometimes we look to the exceptions as if it's the rules. Mm -hmm. The conditions that make, uh, I, I agree with you know, George completely, because I get, so, I get into a heated, um, our, I won't say argument, a heated discussion in the council building when I was talking about adult ed uh, and going in and really advocating for the individuals that we serve. And what I got back was they had their opportunity. Why should we foot the bill for this now? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you how many times, a lot of people say that. And then I have a nice, comfortable conversation about, <laughs> you know, and it, and it really is that did people really have an opportunity when I tell you that my gym floor because we were in a flood zone popped up you know every time there was a hard rain and we lost educational days because of a gym floor or the 400 hall was flooded is that a real opportunity I just happened to have parents who were so dogged about making sure that we got an education uh, and, and because and they had the space. My father worked as a truck driver. You know, he got hired because he could sign his name. I mean, he came up from the farms of, of Birmingham, lied about his age. Got, anyway, I'll tell you the whole story later. <laughs> but, you know, but it, it, I guess the, the, the thing is, they really had a different vision and experience uh, for their children, and we struggled, you know, in a, in a tiny home, but it is the exception. I tell people that I'm one of the luckiest people in the world because I got the two parents who came together at the right time and formed this family. That doesn't happen. And so we start to think of these fantasies that everybody has that experience, and the person who's living in that community should have the same experience that you had, and they should just pull themselves up. You did it. And people really believe it. And, and so when I, you know, going back to, you know, the whole education piece, many of the, the adults, most of the adults that we're serving did not leave school because they didn't care about their education. They could not continue. They had to opt out because there were other things going on in their lives. And as soon as they had an opportunity to get back in, they're back in. So, and, and so those are some of the things, I think, the fallacies that we carry when we're thinking about, um, you know, folks who aren't able to, sort of change your lives as if there's a magic wand to make it happen, so. And, and I would just say it's, it's influence by institutions as well, because you can have people who are the most well-meaning, who are the most community-minded, who have the most networks and relationships in communities, yet if they're walking into a space where the guidelines and the policies and the laws are actually disproportionate and affect people disproportionately, then they're just going to walk into a space that continues to perpetuate inequity. And so, and I, and I know that it's tough, you know, if you think about a, how large a government bureaucracy is and, and how small one person who cares might be, they're going to need the support of organizations like ours, of, of people on the ground, to say that we want there to be a different system, that we want to make sure that there is equity in what we do, that we change policies that need to be changed so they don't 
affect people disproportionately. Because I, I think you can have the most well-meaning people, but if there, if there's nothing that changes about a system that's really made us who we are today, then they're just different placeholders in that system. Okay, tactically, what would you tell the audience uh, who are ready now to do something and get involved? So now, individually and collectively, what would you suggest? There's a lot, there's immediate needs. What could be the immediate action when people leave here they can do in their own lives? I would, I would say look in the mirror. Oh, you took my word. <laughs> <laughs> I would say look in that mirror, give yourself a nice hard look, reflect on your life's journey, reflect on who you are, why you are, and then find those areas that mean a lot to you, that connect to you. So if education is something you value, seek out those groups here in the district or, you know, that, that, that are doing work in that area and see how you can either give time resources, networks, creativity. You know, if it's working with, if, 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 you're a, if you're a mom and you know what it is to have your husband off working and it's, it's almost, and I've seen this in affluent families where, where you, you almost feel as though you're the single mom. <laughs> and you know, then maybe that might be a place, but the first step before venturing, I think, into this work is imperative to have self, deep self-reflection. I don't know what to say, Mary. That's exactly. I don't know. I don't know. I, no, I was going to say almost the exact same thing. It, it begins with you, self-awareness. Check yourself first, because if you don't check yourself first and what you're bringing to um, a situation, you're not doing good. Um, it really is. What am I? What are my biases? Why am I going into this work? What? What am I carrying? What kinds of junk am I carrying that I'm bringing into this work? That I need to be aware of. Once you check yourself, then you can go about and make change honestly and not, you know, out of guilt, not out of, um, you know, all of these other things that get in the way of truly doing the work that needs to happen to help people, uh, not help people help themselves, but I really would say act as a facilitator in the process because people have the power to change their lives. Sometimes we just need a little coaching to get things going. But if you're going in with, I'm, uh, you know, you want to assuage yourself of any guilt that you're carrying or you're going to save people, that's not the right way to do it. Check yourself, do a deep look in the mirror, and then start to, to get, take action. Uh, and I would add, if, if, you, if the lens you want to do your social justice work through is a racial equity lens, you need to get racial equity training. There's, it is not intuitive stuff. Uh, and so many of the folks I know have taken a training called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, which is here in D.C. quarterly. It isn't the only one, though, so you can probably Google some other places. There's a group called Open Source Leadership that does a great racial equity training. Uh, but it isn't intuitive stuff, so if it's through the lens of racial justice, which is in a city like D.C. where 98 to 99 percent of the people who are in poverty are people of color, it makes perfect sense. It probably makes perfect sense almost anywhere in America because people of color are disproportionately affected by poverty. So you could all, probably always uh, hit a solid target. And so I think that's the first place. And I think that's how you come at this the right way, is that you sort of start there. And as they will tell you in the training that we've gone through, you, you are doing equity work when you do that piece alone. If you don't go any further than that, you sort of just become a person who's better positioned to be just and equitable. Uh, and after that, you can start with your family members or your institutions, and you keep on going until you get to City Hall, which is where, by the way, this needs to end ultimately is we need policymakers who think about um, equitable systems. And by the way, I wanted to say something about equity versus equality. Uh, and again, this is a place where I think I'm almost flipping the paradigm because <clears throat> equality is the end goal and equity is the way to get there. Mm -hmm. That if you try to start with equality, uh, what you'll do is make everybody start, or with the assumption everybody's starting from the same place, and that's not, that's a false paradigm. Mm -hmm. That many of those people who are people of color living in poverty are not starting from the same place. Mm -hmm. So you need an equitable thing, which means some of us may need twice as much 
from one level of support than others mm -hmm. if we're ever going to sort of really get this place of equality. So equity is about the right amount of support, the right amount of resources to overcome what usually is sort of some historical kinds of barriers. Uh, and equality is where you end up with, mm -hmm. which is if we do that right, if everybody gets the right amount of everything they need, we'll have a society where we'll have largely equal outcomes. That equal number of us will graduate from high school, will have living wages, will be represented in our communities and leaders. That's the equality we want. But the only way to get that is to make sure that we have more equitable access to the resources and the opportunities that, that lead to those kinds of outcomes. Thank you. Nikisha. So I would agree with all that's been said in terms of specific questions to, to ask yourself. Um, you know, what do you value? Uh, does your life actually reflect that? Uh, there's also a, an exercise that we do with the allies. It's a part of Echo and Green. Um, they have been working with social entrepreneurs. Actually, Public Allies was an Echo and Green program when it got launched. Um, but they have an exercise that's called Head Heart Hustle, and you can Google it if you want. But I, I love the questions. Uh, it asks a series of questions about what are those things you know that you've been trained in, that you're skilled at. Those are the head. Um, the heart is, you know, what are those things that you're passionate about? What do you have a burden? for you know if you had to open one email which one if you had a hundred which one would you go to first and then the hustle is how do those things come together um, how many things can you think of where your heart and your head can come together and that would give you some insight as to where to go next I'm writing that I like down. that <laughs> echoing the brain uh, great organization. Okay, so I've asked enough questions, so I'm going to turn it over to you all. Uh, so um, please uh, raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, and when you stand up, or I think a mic is coming around, when Mike comes around to you, please uh, tell us who you are. Uh, so, who wants to have the first question? Not everybody at once. It's not a great job. No. <laughs> Bob the Kemp. <laughs> I can see why you. I'm uh, Ray Kemp. I'm not sure this is on. We've had a problem with it. Is it? Yeah. It is. <laughs> I keep going. I'm keep going. Um, I can see why you all won the John Thompson Legacy yeah. of the Dream Award. You guys have been incredible. Kathy, you have been too. Oh, Listen. Thank you. <laughs> the mayor says today she went. Yeah, now it's on. The mayor says today, let's vote make it a state. My question is, what do you think this state's going to look like by the time we become a state? And how does that impact what you guys are doing? And can I add one more thing? We're really interested in what Georgetown University needs to be doing, town and gown. So can you put all that together in some kind of way? You know what I'm talking about, I think. Well, one of the interesting things about D.C. is that it's, in a lot of ways, it's having the opposite, and maybe some other urban areas, are, but the country in 10 years from now is going to be a lot more brown than it is white. So nationally, the trend is going to be towards this being, I think by 2050, there'll be more people of color in the United States than not. There'll be the majority, will be, the minority will be the majority, as some people like to say. Um, that doesn't seem to be right now the trend in the district of going the other, right. other direction. So that'll be interesting. There may be some power, to be quite honest with you, there may be some power in terms of what the demographics look like in the district as they continue to try to fight for voters' rights. And that's not necessarily a good thing in terms of why that may happen. But, you know, I think becoming a state is so important that even if it is because the demographics change in a way that sort of flips the level of power the district has, mm -hmm. I think, you know, beggars can't be choosy. I guess we'll, we'll take that because hopefully that will bring to, with it the kind of power and, and autonomy that all the other states enjoy. And so I, I'd love to see that happen. I think mm -hmm. everybody would. I, I would think that there should be some real intentionality behind neighborhoods that haven't gentrified yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I live in Ward 7, uh, and, and I know parts of Ward 8 as well. Uh, where it's, it's very interesting right now. There is 
more racial diversity than I've ever, ever seen my whole life there. Um, yet there are also um, people who look like me uh, who have said, you know, don't build any more affordable housing in my community because we have too much affordable housing. Yet, you know, I've also heard, you know, people who bought houses in Shaw yeah, about 40 years ago and, you know, they said their parents thought they were crazy for doing that and, and now look at it. And so I, I think uh, if we could look at how do we truly create spaces that can work and, and I'm not going to say everyone because it's not always going to work for everyone, but for most people. Uh, and, you know, and, and it means racially diverse. It, it means economically diverse. It means that, you know, we can have a laundromat and a sit down restaurant and a neighborhood bar in the same place and a place for kids to play together. Um, how can we really be intentional about doing that, put some real goals and resources behind that and, and make sure that we're making progress on that while we still have the opportunity? Because though these neighborhoods are still affordable right now, yeah. um, I think that that's the, the key phrase is, is right now. I think, you know, with all, the develop, all of the development that's happening in Ward 8 that's planned near St. Elizabeth's, um, that is changing very quickly and it's becoming less affordable. Uh, but we know this. And instead of just watching it happen, like how do we really come together? And maybe Georgetown can be a part of just being someone who helps to be a stakeholder in that conversation, who helps it to happen, um, to, who helps to make sure that their voice is heard at all levels, that brings some research into it. And I know around the country we haven't done well with this. Um, but what are some factors that could help it to succeed? Yeah, and so at, at Promise, we. I'm very excited about the work that we're doing in this, in this very innovative ecosystem where we're struggling with this whole conversation of poverty right in the middle of gentrification. Uh, Kenilworth Parkside, where we're located, really is not the most blighted. It's not the, it's not the poorest community in the district. There are actually the, 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 the safer, stronger communities that's been identified by our local government actually are in greater need even than Kenilworth Parkside. Our hope is that we can take some of our lessons learned and share with them. So, you know, I'm all for statehood, most definitely. I think that... Um, I agree. I, I, I definitely agree with George that it will provide us with more power, more voice. Um, I think that um, it would be an interesting transitional period. It would be very interesting to see the dynamics mm -hmm. of how that would all be played out. Um, but when I think about Georgetown and its role, I think there's a lot that Georgetown is, is, is currently, you know, uh, currently doing now. And I look at the work that Sister Brenda is doing for so many years and now Chris and, and the team, um, Andrea, you know, I think that we need to build upon a lot of the work that we're currently doing here at Georgetown, but then I do agree with George to, uh, where, where if it's possible, or, or no, what was that, Nikisha, to take, a, to take maybe a, 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 a stronger stand in supporting organizations and framing policies that could change a lot of what's happening in the district as well possibly even, uh, you know, have implications for how, how we deal with inequities and, you know, nationally. So I think Georgetown has a strong voice, strong presence. There's much that we can, be, that we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would echo everything everyone said. I don't have anything new to add to that, <laughs> except that Georgetown should jump all in. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I jump all in, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, if you, if you're going to convene, convene for the long term and bring people together. It's, it's one thing to sort of do a little here, do a, there, but go put a lot of skin in, in the game. And keep you know? having the hard, uncomfortable conversations that makes everybody squirm. Whether they're on your, I don't know, I don't want to say that because I'm sure it's a wonderful board that we have here. <laughs> but, but, you know, th that's the key. The key is you just got to jump in and just and, and have those hard conversations that we're having and then make a commitment and then join us and, and let's map out a plan. Yeah, you lean into the discomfort. I, I agree. Georgetown's yeah. been doing great work. Mm -hmm. I sort of know over the past year I've gotten a chance to witness firsthand where Georgetown's created space for the conversation about race and equity. Mm -hmm. And has uh, and I've and I've heard about initiatives going on now that are exciting about mm -hmm. Georgetown being intentional about its own institutional mm -hmm. sort of love if it. you will restructuring love, love. and, and um, uh, analysis if you will 
Uh, and the only other thing I want to say that hasn't sort of been said, but I want to say this explicitly. I mean, I think we've said it implicitly, but is there is a real um, moral and social case for this kind of justice. But the case for it being the most fiscally important thing to do mm -hmm. is just as strong. Mm -hmm. That whether you're talking about your own institution or breadth of the city or Georgetown or a city or a country, I talked about how this country is going to change over time. So investing in equity, investing in justice <clears throat> in your institutions, it is the right thing to do, but it'll also pay off in the long run mm -hmm. because the way this country is going to evolve. I always another story I tell about that when I try to drive that point. <coughs> so, <clears throat> uh, in, in one of the studies I've heard from one of the sort of racial equity gurus out there, David Williams from uh, uh, Harvard, oh. tells the story about how in 1950, for every one person receiving Social Security benefits, there were 16 people paying into it. So one person receiving benefits, 16 people. By 2050, I think it is, uh, or very, which is closer than we think, there'll be for every one person receiving Social Security benefits, there'll only be two people paying for that. And one of those people is going to be a person of color. And so when you think about policies where right now African Americans make 50 cents on every dollar that white Americans make, that's not a sustainable policy. So that's unjust. Today, it'll be uh, inequitable and in, uh, or sort of bad economics in 2050 when we're looking for that one person who was only making half of what the other person would make to pay in those benefits. That's why programs like those are at risk. And so there's a case to do it because it's the right thing to do, but there's a case to do it because it'll pay off uh, and set and sustain in our society. Great. Who else? Another question. <coughs> back in the back. Hi, this isn't a question, but I wanted to thank you all. My name is Julia Bear Cooper. I'm a philanthropic advisor with um, a couple a of, of different people. family <laughs> foundations that support a lot of this great work. So I'm happy to be here and to thank Georgetown. But I also just want to let folks in the room know, and people at Georgetown in particular, that Washington Grant, I, this morning I spent the morning with a group of um, philanthropists, both staff, professional staff, as well as trustees of um, a number of large foundations and smaller family foundations in um, the metropolitan area talking about this exact issue. Uh, Washington Grant Makers, which is an association where many foundations are affiliated, is putting a series on all spring. Um, and I'm sorry if you said this already. I came in the room a few minutes late. We but, um, okay. um, Called Putting Racism on the Table. And it's looking at implicit bias. It's looking at social, I mean, like structural racism. Mm -hmm. um, today, the session was on criminal justice, the criminal justice system. And so it's something that... Um, Philanthropists are thinking about not only putting their money behind, but also the leverage that we as a community may have and working with um, folks on the ground that are doing the hard work every day, as well as with institutions like Georgetown. And so I think now is the time in the community where you have lots of different sectors coming together talking about this, that if we're going to look at real policy changes and things like that, it's really important. I think George said that you know a piece of it, I think it was George, kind of looking within and whatever kind of personal change you make, but then also how do you take that to kind of your organizations and then the systems at play. So that's I not a question, but I wanted for to say that. that because uh, Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers, the series uh, that they're doing on this, um, they're creating videos, and some of the videos are terrific. And we could get them. Andrea, is that OK? If people are interested, um, they really are really worth watching. Okay. So uh, I think that's one way for us to start thinking about how we can all work together across sectors, philanthropic, nonprofits, and so, such. So thank you. Uh, any other questions? I think we have time. One more question? Well, two. We'll take these two. Okay. Who first? And then that one. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Betsy Griffith. Um, I'm with Venture Philanthropy Partners, which is also a philanthropy, although I was not there this morning. Um, and uh, you all are, are a wonderful panel. And um, so I would just like to go back to this gentleman's uh, second question, which I think uh, you, you all um, maybe didn't didn't quite answer um, and I, I can understand it's but it's been the most emailed story in the New York Times for the last two days uh, and I think all of us that have an affinity with Georgetown and I have two degrees from Georgetown and I used to work here uh, would like 
would like some uh, guidance on what people are thinking about this question. So this is the question about the, the sale of the, of the slaves mm -hmm. uh, all that time ago to help Georgetown keep afloat. Thank you. Well, I, I know that the, 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 the basic answer about slavery and the sort of wealth and uh, how those resources sort of got allocated uh, in a lot of ways at the heart of why uh, it's, it's, it's just. It's really as much, as much about the just question, which is there's nothing you can do about any slavery that your institution or individual did 200 years ago except to, to uh, atone for it. So that's the justice piece, which is there is a real case to be made that many of the institutions that exist in this country, if not all of them, have a debt to pay to slaves and the people and their heirs. And so there's a, there's a case for reparations or mm -hmm. all of the kinds of uh, uh, affirmative strategies that we've tried to begin to deploy in the 60s and still a lot of us are pushing for deployment. That is a, the equitable, well, that is a question around atonement and, mm -hmm. and justice. And again, I think Georgetown would be better off also by looking at how to make sure its, its student body is more diverse, creating more opportunities. Be, and you have to be intentional. Mm -hmm. And this is, goes back to the thing. Is so if, you, if your institution has been propped up by slavery, now you don't have to lose any sleep about fairness. Mm -hmm. This question about do I have, or do I have <laughs> The, do I have the sort of <laughs> argument for doing whatever it takes to make this a more? You do. I mean, you sort of, the, the numbers will support it, right? And the country has that same argument. It doesn't like to always look at it. But we have, we have every excuse to, to level the playing field because we know how this country was built. Uh, and mm. right, so. Yeah. Can I just, yeah. I want to hear, yeah, Mary, no, please. please. I want to hear, no, I want to hear what, that's what I was going to say. I want to oh. hear what you all have to say to add to. Yeah, I, you know, I think it, the, the first step, is admitting that there was a problem. I think that is the first positive step in, in owning that. Uh, when we don't own that, own our crap, as I like to say, mm -hmm. then that, that is the problem. The next step is, just, and that was part of why I said, jump all in. You know, don't dance around the perimeter of mm -hmm. the issue and you know, do a few seminars here or a few seminars there. Do something real and intentional that really moves the ball down the field. Um, you know, saying that we, we did this and admitting that that happened is the first step. But don't, I think it's going to take some real intentional work and effort to say, okay, how can we fix that? And that includes, you know, you know, being the convener, really jumping, using the bully pulpit that you have for all of these other bigger issues to deal with this issue even locally. Um, there's so, Georgetown has so much power and clout uh, that around this issue of racism can, can really, I think, move the needle um, in, in the city in particular. Yeah, and I think Georgetown took the first two very good steps. The first was acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, and I was just, again, chatting with Lauren on the way in, that, you know, I, I felt that it was a, it was a good article. I, I read the article. It, it clearly stated in it, you could see the tension, a group of Jesuits that were saying no, another group saying yay. Again, the human condition. You know, um, I'm a product of the Jesuit Xavier University, and, and, and uh, Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. So, you know, so what's interesting is that in, <clears throat> in the midst of this, the one, admitting it, the two, there's a council, is that correct? There's a, a group that is studying, researching. That's the reflection aspect of it. And then that's deep and very hard work that has to be done. And then in terms of whether it, whether it be atonement and how that's defined, reparations and how that's defined. I mean, the country's still struggling with that one. And now we're coming to a university and asking you to deal with that. I mean, it gets very, it gets, it gets very, it gets very heavy. So I think that the two first steps have been good steps. And quite frankly, that's why I'm saying to, to because there are many steps that, that Georgetown has been, take, been taking even before you know, this thing came out all over Facebook. You know, uh, and, and that is by, yes, going into community, uh, yes, doing the things that you're doing with DC Read, yeah, the stuff that we're doing, you're doing around social justice on a broader level, all the supports that we've gotten east of the Anacostia River. What's important, though, is that, and I, and I can't overstress this, is to not have it come from a place of guilt, blame, and shame. I just, I just have to go there. I think that there's, you can say responsibility, but when we have a university 
that's coming into communities wanting to make things right, black and brown communities, because, oh, I just feel really so, so badly that I go to Georgetown that's so a slave so I can have an education. I mean, really, that's, that's a deal breaker. We don't, we don't need that in community, right? So we have to figure out ways how to respectfully engage community and how we together and how whether it's students, faculty, whatever, can, can again, do whatever research they need to do within themselves, how they can come whole and complete to that process. But I think the two steps that have been taken have been very good. Where it leads from there actually depends, I think, a lot on the research. I understand you're trying to find the families, you're trying to find the, you know, and so I think continue to do exactly what, what's been done. And I think the two steps that we've taken so far, and I do say we because I feel that this is a collective piece, the two steps that we've taken thus far have been good steps. Nikisha, who is an alum, by the way, of McCourt School, do you have anything to add to this? I, I really think that what everyone has said about the process and about what's been done so far, I mean, I, I agree with what they've said. Um, I think this work is hard and, and long term, and so, like, in the processing that there actually will be some ways that you know, that there is accountability and that there are, you know, again, just, just voices and conversation and engagement that happens throughout the process. That it won't just be, okay, now we're, we've taken these steps and um, we've studied and, and now we've, you know, I don't know, we've, 30% of the class is, is now African American. Um, and, and that's it. So I, I think just being intentional and, and long-term in the strategies and that whatever happens, that it's going to require additional support and engagement and accountability and follow-up, and that maybe it could be a model for other institutions that are in the same situation. Like, I definitely agree with George. I, this is upon you right now, Yet, I'm sure that if you look at any of our major institutions, you're going to find similar stories. Absolutely. I agree with that. Piece. I agree with that, yeah. yeah. Georgetown can be a good example for a number of institutions that you know, can look back and find what places that they, and the spaces they played in, mm -hmm. in uh, slavery. You know, for us it's so. a shining opportunity. There is one more question, that I think, over here, and then that. Let's do one more. Yes, I had promised you, and so I do. Uh, my name is Francesca Saunders. I'm a senior in the college here. I'm also in Father Kemp's Struggle and Transcendence class, um, which is kind of where this question is rooted in. George, you mentioned this a little bit, but I would love to hear a little bit more. Um, so we just read both of ta Coates's books, um, Between the World and Me and The Beautiful Struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and in The Beautiful Struggle, it's kind of a letter to his son, um, and he Oops, excuse me, uh, he deals a lot with um, kind of coming to this place of consciousness, consciousness through his own background and kind of the imposition of his parents of reading and opening his mind. And then he raises his son in a position of privilege. And this book is kind of um, him trying to figure out how does he make his own son conscious um, without the same type of background and, you know, the struggle of as you mentioned, you know, you want to raise your kids in this place of privilege and give them all this opportunity, but how do you make them aware and want to help others and know that they did not get there on their own? And I think that this is um, relevant for both people of color and not who are raised in privileged situations, and how do you impart on them a sense of awareness to give back and get involved and do it from a, a place of, you know, not guilt or shame, but truly wanting to help? Yeah, well, my kids have gone, since they were younger, come to work with me, and that gave them some exposure to the other side. And one of my youngest was frightened, actually, by all the poverty and stuff she saw when she'd come to, to the tough areas where we are now. That area is so gentrified that she'd probably feel like she'd want to stop for a, a drink at the cafe or something. But when we first started there, it was pretty, you know, homelessness and all that stuff was so... Uh, present and omnipresent in those communities. So that was really tough. So I tried to expose them to them. They got involved with the charitable events we did. But I don't think that was enough for, for me individually. I'd love to get them to, uh, to actually take this equity training, this racial, because it isn't intuitive stuff. It isn't like around my table we talked about. It. We did, but not in a way that was linear and kind of 
connected, I think. And so I'm, I'm pushing them to do the training now that they are adults and still. And so it's a real important challenge, and, and people of color don't necessarily have any uh, better handle on it than anybody else if they don't, if they're not going to be intentional. So your kids got to be intentional about it too. They got to be exposed. And they've got reason to do that because they have their privilege alone makes it, from my perspective, their responsibility to understand what that's all about. How do I sort of, you know, how do I give back? How do I atone to some degree for the fact that I didn't have to go through what all of my kids got to see the tough things that the families we serve go through and they know the stories and they've seen me speak about it. And so hopefully, they'll be inspired to understand it better now that they are ready. To, none of them have kids yet, but are getting ready to go start their own families. I'm hoping we can get them to, to focus on that. And, and I, I tell you, the, the, having parents who share, share the story, that share their journey on a regular basis, there's a power in the dinner table. You know, we talk about the dinner table not being existing, not existing in, uh, in, in, in marginalized communities, but now that dinner table even doesn't exist in affluent communities. Everybody goes up to their different computers and that sense of coming together and community. So I, I think the key in ensuring that, and again, this is a transfer of knowledge, right? So ending into generational poverty on, on, is on all ends. It's the transfer of knowledge. It's the transfer of, 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 of wealth, however you define that, culture, what have you. And so it's doing exactly as, as, as Brother George was saying here, sharing the story, Having young, the, the, the young people come out and actually experience and touch and feel, but actually making it a part almost of their daily existence if there's any way possible. You know, I had a, I had a nephew who was in Father Kim's class who, uh, you know, again, he grew up with great privilege, right? And so, you know, it, it's, it's a work. It was a constant pull and push for him. On one end, he had a, a group of, of his black counterparts, well, you're not black enough, on the other end, the group of counterparts, well, you're not white enough, and so where do you fall in between, and who am I in this hot mess of, you know, stuff? And so it, it really re depends on the household. If, you, if you're very fortunate to have parents, I was very fortunate to have great parents who went through great struggle. I can share it another time. But, um, yeah, it's, it's the sharing of the story. It's the intentional transfer of knowledge, experience. Sometimes that's even through, through one's faith. You know, so yeah. Um, I'll, I, I would say, you know, I, I think, again, I go back to my parents um, who, the reason that I'm doing the work that I'm doing is because of my parents. My parents, when I was growing up, we had every kind of person you could think of in our home. My dad ran, on, so he was a truck driver, and then he ran a scrap metal business on the side of the yard to make ends meet. But he would hire the local homeless for day labor. They'd come up, they'd say, Mr. Johnson, I need some money, or what? Someone would pull a motor out. I mean, I, my dad was the classic shade tree mechanic, right? So if, any, if you know anything about a shade tree mechanic, you got a nice, strong uh, uh, branch in a tree, you've got a winch, and you can pull a motor out and do all of this stuff. Uh, but I, you know, I was thinking about this years, not, about three years ago, just trying to figure out why am I here? Why does this feel like such the fabric of my being? The, you know, some, doing this work curses through my soul. Right? It's because it's the way my parents brought me up and watching them, and they were very religious. So from a religious thing, my parents would always say, that could be Jesus. So, you know, if that could be Jesus. So you don't treat people differently time, yeah, yeah I, it does that could it could be Jesus. so they were sort of driven by this could be Jesus so you know if this is a hungry person and I have something to share I will bring them into my home and share whatever I can and so I think what that taught me was that seeing beyond the stuff that we see you know we make judgments about people about the way that they present themselves and it really does get back to the whole humanity piece of it and seeing people as human beings and getting beyond the crap and compassion plays a huge role in that and teaching compassion and seeing people as human beings and 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 and, and the value that they bring to this world uh, i think that's I think that's at the very core of being able to help people realize that, you know, that I'm no different than this person, even though their economic situation is different or my educational situation. I am the same. We're more alike than we are different. And living that, um, I think, makes it, if you, I think if you teach children that, 
that's the core of really being able to understand how, how the world works and how you can connect with other people at a deeper level. Thank you. One final word, Nikisha. I, I think it's also creating experiences um, where they really would have to grapple with difference. Um, you know, certainly maybe as young adults, but also, you know, how do you start off with, you know, what do we do with our toys that are nice, but that we don't like anymore? What do we do with our clothes? And seeking out situations where there might be people from different backgrounds that actually talk and, and get to know each other. Like, I know there aren't a whole lot of spaces, um, but it really is about being intentional, as everyone has said, because we're so programmed and busy. Um, it's like almost every moment of the day we're in motion or we're taking the kids to an activity or, you know, we're trying to do housework when there's a little bit of time. Uh, and so I think it is really making it a priority that you want your child to have an experience and that it's not just for now, but it's something that is going to affect them for the long term. I would also say travel. Um, I, uh, I was a group leader for a program called the Experiment in International Living. And they say there are two experiments. Um, one was that you get to go to another country. Uh, the second one is that um, you get to reflect on your life here in the US. Uh, and so as a group leader, I, I took a group of young people, you know, a lot of them who hadn't been outside of New York City to Ghana. And it was an amazing experience that helped them not only just reflect on, on Ghana and how it was to deal with a different culture, but what was common about what they would see. Uh, you know, it was a little more in your face uh, when people came up to ask for money in Ghana, but it made them think about homelessness where they lived in New York City. And so that's another way, I think, to bring in perspective that might even be more eye-opening uh, than the shields that we place or the, just the, the barriers um, or the ways that we separate ourselves in our average daily life. So I think our time is up. Uh, I told you at the beginning how honored I was to be in the presence of these four amazing people, and now you can see why. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Um, what I am going to do in my classes will make the video available and have conversations around that, share it on my website, and we could think about a lot of other things. But your voices should be heard loud and clear, and we look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Refreshments are outside, right? Thank, right. thank you all very much. Um, uh, let me just add my own word of thanks That's to right. the panelists um, uh, and to the, uh, to the organizers. Um, really, on behalf of the university and behalf of, of the uh, working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, of which I'm the chair, um, and on behalf of everybody in the library, thank you very much. Uh, there was a metaphor that was used uh, in the final go-round about a dining room table, and one of the things we're trying, in a sense, very hard to do is get a conversation going around a dining room table um, about some really important things that uh, we might not have been immediate participants in, but we're the heirs of it. Um, and knowing what we're the heirs of is a step in the direction of uh, maybe from heart to head to hustle, um, or so we hope. Um, uh, but thank you for bringing your experiences and your insights uh, uh, and your, your so many good works uh, to the dining room table that we're trying to set up here. Um, we're very grateful for that. So thank, thank you once again. As long as we're talking about dining room tables, there are refreshments. <laughs> um, and they're, they're uh, across the hall in the back room. Um, uh, that will go on for, I suppose, uh, a, a while. At 7 o'clock, there's the next uh, event in our symposium today um, in commemoration of, of Emancipation Day. Um, it's, a, it's a docudrama, 
and it will it starts at seven o'clock in St. William's Chapel. It's called God and Country, and it's a docudrama written and directed by Reverend Christy Adams, who's a chaplain in residence and part of our campus ministry uh, community here. You do need to have tickets, um, and I'm not sure how available any of them still are, but. Uh, even if you can't make it uh, this evening to that event, which is in St. William's Chapel, so another place, the events for our Emancipation Day commemoration continue tomorrow evening, Tuesday evening. There are two events that are running more or less concurrently, but they, uh, in one sense, couldn't be more different. Um, at 7 o'clock, Dr. Ed Baptist, uh, Professor Cornell, who's an alumnus of Georgetown um, and a his an economic historian, is giving a talk on... Uh, the relationship of slavery and the rise of American capitalism. He's a very eminent historian, and um, we're delighted to have him come back to campus to talk about his latest research. That's at 7 o'clock. That would be for the head. And then the other uh, event tomorrow evening starts at 7.30 in the Healy Family Student Center, and uh, that's a master class in Western African dance. Um, the instructions I have uh, to pass along to you is um, please dress comfortably. <laughs> and so with that, I uh, thank you again for coming and spending hours of the day with us and enjoying the reception that's prepared across the hall.